Lashana Tova Tika Tebu. We are so glad you are here with us for the beginning of these High Holy Days. It's a new time, but it's the same day every year, first of Tishrei. And we're delighted you're here with us. So join us, please, in a beautiful nigun that Cantor brought us called Zadie's Nigun. Sing along with us. It's a song without words. And then we'll go to Avinu Makenu that ushers in our themes of the High Holy Days. our brand new books. As I said last night, make new friends and keep the old. Yom Kippur is silver, and the one in your hands, Rosh Hashanah, is? So we have a brand new book, and the book is an extraordinary vehicle for our prayers. For some of us, it's a familiar look because it's a reminder of what our Shabbat book looks like, which will be, if you open up to any page in the gold book, Take a look. You'll see on the right side is Hebrew and transliteration of the Hebrew on the page. And there is also a faithful translation, not a paraphrase, but a faithful translation of that prayer. There are on some pages little lines, and under them are notes, notes that actually give us commentary about the prayer or who may have written the prayer or who is the author of the particular poem that might be on the left side of the page. Because the left side of the page, often in a gray wash, the left side are creative interpretations of the prayer. Maybe a different way than someone wrote it 1,800 years ago. Maybe a new poet of our generation or a rabbi of our time who had an explanation that was a bit different. Sometimes, in fact, the prayer book may have alternate theology. What may be on the right side in the traditional way of looking at things may in fact have a different view entirely on the left side. There is no one single theology in our book. It's an opportunity for us to dig within and find that which can be meaningful for each of us. 
We're very grateful to so many donors who gave us these books and endowed them both in honor and in memory of their loved ones. And we're very, very grateful that two families honored us with exceptional gifts to make sure we could all have prayer books for the first time in our congregation's history. Everybody here has a book. Oh, and you do have to leave it behind. Did I mention that? <laughs> a book that stays here in the synagogue because we want to make sure that everyone has a book at our congregation. Think of the years past when a guest might come from out of town and not know that he needed a book. Or your family member from Paducah who happened to be here and she didn't realize she needed a book. We now have books for everyone in our congregation. So I want to thank Emily and Adam Bold, and I want to thank Deborah and Ivan Kallick who are joining us on the Bema today, and I'd like to present them with a copy of our Mishkan Hanefesh from a very grateful congregation. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> Friends, we're going to turn now to page 110 as we begin with the words that you may have seen in Hebrew as you entered our lobby. Matovu ohalecha Yaakov, Mishkanotecha Yisrael, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. 110. of prayer that Kanner Shapiro has brought us has been our Shabbat Zimra, our opportunity for unique prayer with Yuval Ron on the instrument called the Oud and Avanahas who plays 87 drums and musical percussion things all at the same time. And Ava is going to join us on page 135, friends, as we turn to Psalm 100. And 50. This is an uplifting version by Cantor Benji Ellen Schiller.
We come here today full of hope. Hope for a better tomorrow. Hope for a year full of blessing and possibility. Hope that the pain of last year is but a distant memory. Hope in the comfort of this community. A hope that what we are doing here today is real. That our prayers are real. That God is listening. And that we are connecting. Let us take this day to heart. May our words ascend. And may our words transcend. We turn together to page 138. Holy One, infinite your power, radiant your glory, unbounded your might, awe-inspiring your works. Eternally present, your name is hallowed on high, and the psalmist sang, Rejoice in Adonai, you righteous. Let the upright adorn you with praise. We turn together and we read at the top of page 139, offering these words as one community. Beloved friend who calls us to conscience, reminds us of our own strength, invites us to grow, empowers us to act. Cosmic mysteries are yours, but the earth is ours to tend and heal as best as we can. Beloved partner in creation, we join our strength with yours to make you real and true. We turn together to page 140 at the bottom. Blessed are you, Adonai, sovereign of praise, source of the impulse to give thanks, crown of wonders, who desires a world filled with song and a universe of life. We rise together at the top of page 142 for our official call to worship, our Baruch Hu. enter this new year with promise and with possibility, let us center ourselves before we turn to page 150 for our Shema in which we call that God is one. Let us take a moment to breathe in the beauty of this new day, the beauty of this new year. You may be seated as we invite up the officers of our senior youth group unity to join us up here on the bima to help lead us in vea hafta on page 152 for our unity officers please join us page 152 for the chanting of our vea hafta
such uh, a beauty and wonder to see our children not just stand up here for their bar and bat mitzvah, but to remain here years long after and be able to lead us in prayer. Currently right now in our congregation, this is not the only service that's taking place. In room 307, for the first time, we have a youth service uh, that is being led by our director of education, Jesse Downey, our rabbinic intern, Lynette Herzog, and our musical guest, uh, David Cohen. So our youth are praying together simultaneously on this Rosh Hashanah morning. We continue together as we turn as one congregation to page 163. And at the bottom of the page, we read together, remember the stories of slavery and you will never stop working for freedom. Remember their fear at the edge of the sea and self-doubt will never defeat you. Remember when desperation turned to celebration and you will never let go of hope. Remember the words of the Baal Shem Tov, forgetfulness leads to exile. Remembrance is the secret of redemption. Micha Mocha, page 164. us does not sit during the High Holy Days and feel the memories of the generations that have come before us. It's the reason our tefillah begins with a prayer that takes us all the way back to our first fathers and mothers, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, Rachel. So we turn, friends, to 166 and then we'll flip the page on to 168 so that we can sing our introduction to prayer, Adonai Sfatai, and then right into our 
Avot and Zochrenu on 168. I invite all who are able to please rise.
Giving power is forever, Adonai, with us in life and in death. You liberate and save, cause dew to descend, and with mercy abundant, lovingly nurture all life. From life to death, you are the force that flows without end. You support the falling, heal the sick, free the imprisoned and confined. You are faithful even to those who rest in the dust. Together, power beyond power, from whom salvation springs, sovereign over life and death who is like you, merciful God, who compares with you. With tender compassion, you remember all creatures for life. Faithful and true, worthy of our trust, you sustain our immortal yearnings. In you we place our undying hopes. Wellspring of blessing, power eternal, you are the one who gives and renews all life. Amen. We invite you to please take your seats as we turn, friends, to 174. So among the most difficult prayers, the most challenging text is the Unetana Tokef. And we will see both this morning on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur morning that it is a text that many have grappled with. So you will see here, as Canner and the choir and Susan and Bill lead us so beautifully in the music, you'll see a new translation of Unetana Tokef that my colleagues struggled with very, very much to try to shape the words that have been into an English language that isn't exactly what the Hebrew tries to say. And you'll see on the face pages different interpretations of them as we continue now, friends, with Unetana Tokef, 174 and then 176. Unetane Tokef Kedushat Ayom Ki Oh, <laughs> 
Page 178, the very two lines at the top. On Rosh Hashanah, this is written on the fast of Yom Kippur, it is sealed.
But through return to the right path, through prayer and righteous giving, we can transcend the harshness of the decree. You are everything that we praise you for, slow to anger, quick to forgive. You do not wish the death of sinners, but urge them to return from their ways and live. Until the day of death you wait for them. You accept them at once if they return. Since you created us, you know our impulses. We are but flesh and blood. 182. Together. We who are mortal, our origin is dust, and so is our end. We wear out our lives to get our bread, like broken vessels, like withered grass, like a flower that must fade, a shadow moving on, a cloud passing by, mere dust on the wind, a dream that flies away. But for you, ever-living sovereign, time has no limits. Your presence, unbounded by days and years, is everywhere a glorious mystery none can decipher. Your name is worthy of you, and you are worthy of your name, and our name you have linked with yours. We turn to 184, friends, and rise for our Kedusha. Kesham sham makdishi motu bishme marum kakatu vayun nebiyecha mekara zehi hamzei lehamar. Turn to 196. Let's read together. Our God and God of the generations before us, may a memory of us ascend and come before you. May it be heard and seen by you, winning your favor and reaching your awareness, together with the memory of our ancestors, the memory of your sacred city, Jerusalem, and the memory of your people, the family of Israel, May, May we, we be remembered, remembered for, for safety, safety well-being, and favor, for love and compassion, for life and for peace on this day of remembrance. I'd like to take a moment to teach something to you, and it's something that I hope you'll take with you throughout the holy days, and something that I hope you'll be able to use and will take advantage of using during out the holy days, and that is that prayer is supposed to, at its best, be a conversation. And so you'll find that there are times when you can't sing along with me. And that's okay because you have a really, really important job. And that is to help out with the Amen. So Amen has a couple of purposes and it comes from the word Emunah, which means trust. It means I have faith. I agree with you. So when you're saying Amen after I say a prayer, it's as if you've said the whole prayer yourself. So what I want to teach you is the special way that we sing Amen together on the High Holy Days. And you'll hear the choir sings this all the time. And I hope that 
you'll join them from here on out. So the high holiday amen goes like this. Amen. You can do it an octave lower, Rabbi. Okay. <laughs> amen. <laughs> So I hope you'll join me now, and then we're going to do Zochreinu. We're going to chant the prayer Zochreinu at the bottom of the page, and there are three opportunities for us to join together in that high holiday. Amen. So let's try it together as a practice first. Amen. So nice when we sing together. Zochreinu Adonai Friends, we have three different times that we sound the shofar during this morning. And first among them, we turn now to page 202 as I invite forward Dr. Joshua Weeder, our shofar, our Baal Tekiah, our blaster master. And we turn to 202 and invite all who are able to please rise for Alenu, which begins this portion of the service for the sounding of shofar. Ribono Shalom, power of all, have compassion on the souls of Israel. Open their hearts to do tshuva before you. Open their souls for the sake of returning to you. 206, our blessings, and then our first set of the three calls. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech Asher kirishanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lishmal kol shofar. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shehechiyanu v'kiyamanu. Tekia, Shvarim Trua, Tekia. 
Takia Takia Shvarim Takia Takia Terua Takia To our sages who toiled, to the one who chopped wood, to the one who raised cattle, to the storekeeper, the cobbler, and the one who sold salt, to the one who brewed beer and the one who filled casks of wine, to the tailor, the teacher, the dealer in cotton, to the one who scrubbed clothing, to the keeper of vines, to the merchant of silk, to the one who plowed fields, to the builder of houses, to the doctors and scribes, to the blacksmith, the tanner, the digger of graves. Let us give thanks for a tradition that sanctifies work. Let us honor those who toil and sustain the world in noble and humble ways. We acknowledge those whose labor goes unnoticed. We praise the strength of their hands and the dedication of their hearts. We turn, friends, to 216 for Sim Shalom.
We continue silently, friends, page 217. One of the amazing opportunities that we rabbis and cantor had in preparation for these High Holy Days was actually reading through the whole book. I never did that in 38 years of preparing High Holy Day services. I was a student rabbi, I was an assistant rabbi, I was an associate rabbi, I was a congregational rabbi of my own shop, and then every time I inherited whatever had been done before. But this year we've gone through and seen and as you've seen, selected this and maybe not that and struggled with these words and added that song and tried to weave together and yet there are some things that anchor us. 
that bring us back, no matter what the words are, that bring us back to our own feelings about our prayer. And so we turn, friends, as we open the Holy Ark, page 223, to Max Janowski's Avinu Makenu, followed by our folk version, let all who are able please rise. happening because it's a joy for us to see that the youth from our youth service have just come down and filled up the back and we're really delighted that they're all here this new way of engaging our kids and so we turn now friends as the ark is open and the Torah scrolls await for us for the service for the reading of Torah we begin on 228 
חסד ואמת, לא צל חסד לאלפים, נושא עוון ופשע וחטא ונקה. אדוני אדוני, God compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving and true, showing mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving evil, defiance, wrongdoing, and granting pardon. Shema Yisrael Exalt the Eternal with me. Let us exalt God's name together.
We'd like to invite forward our illustrious past presidents of University Synagogue to join us for our first Aliyah this morning. We'd like to invite forward our readers, Emily Badner, Zeb Spencer Shapiro, Mira Chaskis, Jordan Tushin, and Rachel Weiss. If you'd all come forward at this time. Yitzchak, 
El Eret Hamoria Bicha Alei Urusham Leolam Al Echad Chicharim Asher Omar Elecha Vayash came Avraham Aboker Vayachavosh at Hamoro Vayka et Shanaim Arav Ito Vayet Yitzlak Beno Vayvaka Ase Ola Vayakom Vayelach El Hamakom Asher Amarlo Chachelochim Vayom Hashlishi Vayisa Avraham Et Enav Vayar Et Hamakom Merachok Ravata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Natan Lanu Torah Emet Vechaye olam natab letochenu Baruch atad anay notin ha-Torah Amen We thank all of you. As Zev comes forward to be our Torah reader, we invite to the Aliyah two of our young ladies who were in Israel with Nifty this summer, Natanya Chaskis and Riley Pressman, and Gia Friedberg, our Unity President, who represented Los Angeles on the gold-winning soccer team at the Maccabiya Games. And so we invite them forward for the Aliyah now. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bahar Banu Mikol Ha'amim Benatan Lanu Atoratim Baruch Ata Adonai Notein HaTorah Amen Vayomer Avraham El Ne'arav Shavu lachem po Im hachamor V'ani v'henar Nelcha ad ko V'nishtacha v'nashuva Aleichem V'yikach Avraham Et atzei Aviv Vayomer Aviv Vayomer Hinani Vini Vayomer Hine Hine Haish Vahaitim Vaye Hase Lola Vayomer Avraham Elohim Yerai Lo'u Haseh Ola Bini Vayelchu Shneihem Yachdav Baruch Ata Arai Elohim Yemelech Alam Asher Na 
Atan Manu Tarat Amen. Behaye Olam Natal Betahin Baruch Ata Amen. Natin Hatara. Our next Torah reader is Mira Chaskis, and we invite forward the officers of our sisterhood for the bracha. Baruch Adonai Hamurach Leolam Ba'ed. Baruch Adonai Hamurach Leolam Ba'ed. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim. Vetanatanu et Torato. Baruch Adonai Notein HaTorah. Amen. Hamakum, Hashem Alo Elohim, Vayven Sham Avraham, Het Hamiz Beach, Vayaroch Et Haitzim, Vayakod Het Itzak Bino, Vayasem Oto Al Hamiz Beach. Mi ma laitim. Vishlach Avraham et yado. Vikach et hamachelet. Lishchot et bino. Vayikra elav. Malach Adonai min hashamayim. Vayomer Avraham. Avraham. Vayomer hineni. Baruch atadonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah demet, vechaye olam nota betochenu. Baruch atadonai, noten ha Torah. And I might note, as a sister that stands here before us, that Julia Weinstein, has been nominated to be a national vice president of the Women for Reform Judaism. You can count them on, I think, one hand, how many vice presidents there are. Four. Four. Without the thumb. <laughs> so it's a great honor for our congregation, and we honor Julia. Yay. Thank you. We bring forward the uh, liaisons to all our chavurot, and our Torah reader is Jordan Tushin. So if you are one of the conveners of our Chavarot, whether a Chavara from formed in uh, years gone by or a Chavara that has been newly formed, join us here on the Bima now for our fourth Aliyah. Vayomer, 
Tishlach, Yad Hail Hanar, Beltas Lome Uma, Ki Atayadati, Ki Ere Elohim Ata, Belo Hasachta, Et Bincha et Yehidcha, Mimeni. Vai Avraham et enav. Vai ar vehine ayil ahar ne ehas bas vach bekarnav. Vai ele Avraham vai kata ayil vai alehu le ola tahat beno. Vai kra Avraham. Shem hamakom hahu Adonai yir e Asher ye omer hayom Bahar Adonai ye ra e Baruch et Adonai Eloheinu melchalom Asher nathalonu terat emet we thank Jordan and our Chavura liaison. Rachel Weiss is going to be our Torah reader, and we invite forward this year's Heroes honorees for our annual. Gala Benefit, Doreen Gelfand and Elizabeth Gelfand Stearns. And our co chairs of the evening, which I hope you will join us at, Jocelyn Silverman and Deborah Price. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Asher Bahar Banu Mikol Hamim. Benatan Lanu Et Arto. Baruch Ata Adonai No Tain HaTorah. Amen. Shamayim, Vayomer, Vain Yishvachi, Nehum Adonai, Ki Yan Asher, Asita, Et Hadabar Haseh, Velo Asacha, Et Bine, Et Yehideha, Ki Barba Arbe, Ahareh. Baruch 
Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu torat emet, v'chaye olam ata v'tohenu, baruch ata Adonai, noten ha-torah. Amen. Let us rise. in good hands, friends. You may be seated. <laughs> we turn, friends, to our Misha Berach, a time for thinking about those in need a time to consider those who need our support, who need our prayers, who need our visits, who need our caring. As I glance around the congregation, it's clear that there are many whose lives have been touched by these prayers throughout the past year, and we hope, indeed, that they touch others as well. But beyond the prayer is the care. If you have someone that you'd like to recall at this time, please feel comfortable in mentioning his or her name. Maya Wigley, Cantor Mark Ogatai. Felix Aquino, Rala Rubin, Richard Lobenthal, mm -hmm. Carol Brooke, Gail Doughty, Marilyn Adder, Howard Goldstein. We hold all their names in our hearts, friends, as well as those that we carry silently within as we turn now to Misha Berach.
Ali to offer the blessings, and Cami Gordon to offer the Haftarah. You may follow it, friends, a blessing on 247, and then the reading from Haftarah on 250 from the book of Samuel. Kadosh Kadonai ki ain biltecha ve ain sur kelohenu altar bu te dar bru givoa givoa yet se atak mi pichem ki el de ot Adonai. Velo ni kenu alilot keshet giborim chatim benik shalim azru chayil sevim balechem nizkaru ur evim tadelu al akara yelda shiva. Verabat banim umlale Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech haolam Sur kohalamim Sadik bechol hadorot Ha'el haneman Ha'omer ve'ose Ha'medaber umekaye Shekho devara emet vat sedek al hatora ve al havoda ve al hanivim ve al yom hazikaron haze shenata talanu Adonai Eloheinu lechavodu latifaret al hakol Adonai Eloheinu anach nu modim lach umvarhim otach. Yit barashim chaviv li kochai tamim le ulam vaed udvarcha emed ve kayam laad baruch ata adonai melech al kol haaretz mechadesh Yisrael ve yom hazikaron. Friends, we're going to invite all who are able to please rise as we return the Torah now to the Ark.
Joseph Stalin is standing on Vladimir Lenin's mausoleum in Red Square. Comrades, he tells the crowd, an historic event has occurred. I have received a telegram of congratulations from Leon Trotsky. The crowd hushes. Stalin reads the telegram. Joseph Stalin, the Kremlin, Moscow. You were right, and I was wrong. You are the true heir of Lenin. I should apologize, Leon Trotsky. The crowd roars. But in the front row, there's a small Jewish tailor, and he gestures to Stalin. Stalin leans over to hear what the tailor has to say. Such a telegram, says the tailor. But you didn't read it with the correct Yiddish feeling. Stalin raises his hand and stills the crowd. Comrades, he says, we have here a simple worker, a Jew no less, who says, I read Trotsky's telegram without the right feeling. I am asking the worker to read it to us the way he thinks it should be read. He gives the telegram to the tailor, who gets up in front of the gigantic crowd. <coughs> he clears his throat and reads, Joseph Stalin, the Kremlin, Moscow. You were right, and I was wrong. <laughs> you are the true heir of Lenin. I should apologize. <laughs> it seems this time of year, the telegram we get is what's called the Jewish telegram. Start worrying. Details to follow. <laughs> the message has been received loud and clear during the last year, a year of difficulty all around the globe for the Jewish people as anti-Semitism reared its ugly head. Seventy-seven different countries reported various degrees of anti-Jewish harassment, from discriminatory laws to social hostilities, vandalism to violent assaults. And that makes us worry here as we are all connected to the Jewish people wherever we live. In Morocco, Rabbi Moshe Ohayon was beaten up by a young man. The chief rabbi's home was attacked in the Netherlands. Anti-Semitic slogans such as, gas the Jews, popped up in protests in Germany. The Brussels Jewish Museum was the site of a shooting that left three dead. We can recall what happened in France, where many synagogues were targeted with cries of death to the Jews and then the horrifying Charlie Hebdo murders, followed by the terrorist attack at the Delhi, with a horrifying loss of life. Shortly thereafter, Parisian Jews were trapped in a synagogue, fearing a pogrom, only saved by one simple cell phone call to the police. The result of these attacks has been the highest level of Aliyah from France to Israel. There are now 7,000 Jews who are new citizens of Israel, whose native language was French. Now, some of, these, some of these events stemmed from a response to the war in Gaza last year. But the comments are not about Israel or Zion. They rapidly turn against Jews as a whole. Prime Minister Manuel Valls of France has declared that this virulent hatred against Israel is a new variety of anti-Semitism in France. We have the old anti-Semitism, and I'm obviously not downplaying it, that comes from the extreme right. But this new anti-Semitism comes from difficult neighborhoods, from immigrants from the Middle East and North Africa who have turned anger against Israel into just a pretext. There is something far more profound taking place now. What is causing this loud, vociferous, intense, and sometimes bone-chilling anti-Semitism? There is more to it than access to 24-hour news on the Internet and a place on the web that is just a cesspool of bigotry and cancerous hate. When I was young, I thought that anti-Semitism was a problem of past generations. It would never again regain the destructiveness of the 1930s and the 40s. Oh, sure, there might still be inappropriate jokes, but the hatred my father experienced getting beat up on the way to school in South Dakota, no, I thought that was forever of the past and not of the future. But today, anti-Semitism has taken on a different form. It's wrapped in the garb 
of anti-Israel rhetoric. The venom against Jews and Judaism is married to a hatred of Israel. Now, in ancient times, anti-Semites fixated on the Jewish observances of Shabbat, Kashrut, and circumcision. Jews did not work on Saturday. They did not eat pork. They had strange and unusual customs. In medieval times, the blood libel was added to the lexicon of anti-Semitism. Jews, they said, sacrificed Christian children to use their blood to bake the matzah. Jews were responsible for the killing of Jesus. Riots and pogroms followed. Jews were murdered. In modern times, anti-Semitism metastasized into something even far more sinister and deadly. Jewish identity became racial. It was a matter of blood. It was not something a Jew could renounce by conversion or a rejection of Jewish grandparents or tradition. The Nazis argued that if a person had one Jewish grandparent, they were Jewish. Whether or not they were observant or even called themselves Jewish, they were marked for death. And now, much of the horrific anti-Semitism comes from people who are in Europe, but not of Europe. And so, sadly, all the age-old anti-Semitic tropes have been adopted by the Muslim world, where the blood libel has no connection to either its holy texts or its history. Want to see the anti-Semitic forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion? It's a weekly TV show in Cairo. And this vicious hatred, what my mother, Aleha Shalom, would have called rishis, has become interconnected in the Arab world within the broader Gordian knot of Israeli-Palestinian relations. The old anti-Semitism is covered up by a patina of anti-Zionism. The BDS movement, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, argues that Israel, the homeland of the Jews, must be delegitimized in the eyes of the world, held to a double standard, and demonized. BDS has done a great job of uniting campus minorities against the state of Israel, and its vitriol is directed at Jews on campus. Jews there are not seen as a minority, but rather as part of the majority white culture, dominant and oppressive. But we know that Israel is a vibrant democracy. Within Israel and throughout the world, we have seen gigantic discussions of Israel's policies, its decisions and actions. For debate and dissent are the cornerstone of any vibrant democracy. But when one attacks the legitimacy of the state of Israel, when one argues that Israel's very existence is illegal, when Jews are attacked openly in a student senate, or swastikas on a frat house, this is anti-Semitism disguising itself as anti-Zionism, and it is ricious through and through. But in the world we live today, these actions have not been met with silence. The leaders of France, Germany, and Great Britain all spoke out against anti-Semitism. Our state assembly and senate have passed laws opposing anti-Semitism on campus, and now the University of California Regents are debating hatred and anti-Semitism on campus. The United States has a special envoy in the State Department to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Now, the basis for these changes is not only extraordinary Christian guilt after the Holocaust, but also the adoption of Nostra Aetate 50 years ago, a document meaning in our time. Convened by Pope John XXIII, the Second Vatican Council endorsed a change in the Church's 2,000-year-old relationship with the Jewish people. It cleared the Jews of responsibility for the death of Jesus, renounced its traditional claim that Jews had been rejected by God, condemned anti-Semitism, and called for mutual understanding and respect between Catholics and Jews. It helped greatly that the Pope was friends with Jews, and especially Abraham Joshua Heschel. As the Vatican's envoy to Turkey from 1935, John XXIII helped save the lives of thousands of Eastern European Jews facing persecution from the Nazis, including giving Hungarian Jews fake baptismal certificates. 
But he was not the only pope to have Jewish friends and be so helpful. A few months before World War II ended, a young Polish priest named Karol Wotyla rescued a starving 13-year-old Jewish girl at a train station by carrying her to the rail car in which he was traveling, feeding her and covering her with his coat. Even under pressure from others, he refused to convert a child taken into his church. He would affect even more Jewish lives when he became Pope John Paul II. And who was his closest childhood friend? A Jewish guy named Jerzy Kluger, with whom he played soccer and lived nearby. Together, starting 50 years ago, they worked to revolutionize strained relations between Catholics and Jews. John Paul II became the first pope to visit a synagogue and in 1988 issued an official act of repentance for the errors and failures of the sons and daughters of the church during the Holocaust. In many ways, these remarkable events occurred because each pope had a Jewish connection. Yet in the world of the West Side in which we live, many of us live in a Jewish bubble. We go to school with lots of Jewish kids which are shut down on the High Holy Days. We go to college where 20 or 25 percent of the students are Jewish. Many of our friends, if not most, are Jewish. And that is all positive. But if we have no friends of other faiths, then we are losing the opportunity to build relationships, to establish friendships, and to create warm bonds. For our own narrow self-interest, we need friends of all faiths. The major changes in the Catholic Church came about when priests, bishops, cardinals, and popes did not see us as objects of derision, but as children of the one God. They looked into real Jewish eyes and saw real living people not the caricatures of history. And so let me echo the words of my colleague and friend, Rabbi Mark Gelman. If we want to reduce the amount of anti-Semitism that may be out there, let us begin by making friends with others as well, especially Muslims. We work, we study, we connect with people of all creeds and colors outside these walls. And we need to build our coalitions with all faiths on a foundation of friendship. Listen to this true and remarkable story about what friendship can do as an antidote to anti-Semitism. One Sunday morning in June 1991, Cantor Michael Weiser and his wife Julie were unpacking boxes in the kitchen of their new home in Lincoln, Nebraska, when the phone rang. The cantor heard a harsh and hateful voice say slowly and loudly, you will be sorry you ever moved in here, Jew boy. Then the line went dead. Over the next few days, hate mail arrived from the Ku Klux Klan, and the police focused on a local Klan leader, Grand Dragon Larry Trapp. He was a 44-year-old loner, a diabetic, in a wheelchair, and a major link in the white supremacist movement. He had firebombed several African-American homes around Lincoln and burned the Indo-Chinese Refuge Assistance Center in Omaha. And at that time, he was planning to bomb Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, where Weiser was a spiritual leader. When the Grand Dragon started a radio show, Canner Michael Weiser began to leave his own messages. Larry, he said, why do you hate me? You don't even know me. How can you hate me? Another time. Larry, do you know that the first laws the Nazis passed were against people like you who had physical deformities and physical handicaps? One night he turned to his wife and said, what am I going to do if the guy ever picks up the phone? <laughs> Julie said, tell him you want to do something nice for him. Tell him you'll take him to the grocery store or something, anything anything just to keep him talking and catch him totally off guard. Weeks later, as the cantor made the call, that voice he had recognized picked up the phone. You are harassing me, said Larry Trapp. What do you want? Make it quick. Michael remembered Julie's advice. 
well, I was thinking you might need a hand with something, and I wondered if I could help. I, I understand you're in a wheelchair, and I thought maybe I could take you to the grocery store or something. Trap slammed the phone down. And then, at a visit to his eye doctor, Trap felt his wheelchair moving. I helping you on elevator, said a young female nurse from Vietnam. That evening, he found himself crying as he thought about his assaults on the Vietnamese community. I'm rethinking a few things, he told Michael in a subsequent phone call. But a few days later, he was back in the groove on TV, shrieking about kikes and half-breeds and the Jews' media. Furious, Michael called Trapp, who answered his phone. It's clear you're not rethinking anything at all. In a tremulous voice, Trapp said, I'm sorry I did that. I've been talking trash like that all of my life. I can't help it. I'll apologize. The next day, the Weiser's phone rang. I want to get out, Trapp said, but I don't know how. Michael suggested that he and Julie go over to talk in person and break bread together. Trapp hesitated, then finally agreed and let them in. When they met, Larry began to sob. I'm so sorry for all the things I've done, he said. Michael and Julie put their arms around Larry and hugged him. Overwhelmed by emotion, they all started crying, all, all of them. And on November 6, 1991, the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, Larry Trapp, resigned from the Klan and quit all other racist organizations. He apologized to the many people he had threatened by writing letters, and he said, I wasted the first 40 years of my life causing harm to other people. Now I've learned we're only one human race. On New Year's Eve, Trapp learned he had only one year left to live. That night, the Weissers invited him to move into their home, and he did so. They converted their living room into his bedroom where they cared for him. He began to listen to Gandhi and Martin Luther King and read the Jewish books that were on the cantor's wall in the living room. Larry Trapp converted to Judaism in the very synagogue he had planned to blow up. He died later that year. Friends, anti-Semitism may not be going away, but one friendship at a time can make all the difference. Let's do our best in the year ahead. Amen.
We invite up to the pulpit Dr. Joshua Weeder as we turn as a congregation to page 263 as we enter Zichro Note, the remembrance section of our shofar service, page 263. Let us offer these words responsively. A messenger from another time, a stranger here in our midst, the shofar sounds remembrance. After the flood in the wake of destruction, Noah discovered the rainbow. At the end of her strength, afraid for her child, Hagar found a well in the wilderness. Remember, wherever you go, I am with you. In the sounding of the shofar, we summon them back. Zichronot, memories of those who saw signs of your presence. A rock gives forth water. Hope can blossom in the desert. And when loving hands lighten our darkness, you are there. When we are caught in the thicket, feel alone or forgotten, the shofar sounds remembrance. From the deep well of the past, in the depths of our own despair, the shofar sounds remembrance. Remember, my presence goes with you and will lighten your burden. We turn together to page 267. God of remembrance, remember the covenant of our ancestors. We reaffirm it today. Remember, we are a people of noble ideals. Help us attain them. Remember all of your people, all the nations on the road to peace. Bless their efforts. Remember with mercy the binding of Isaac, the sorrow of Sarah, Abraham's words, Hineni, here I am. Together we rise to the sounding of the shofar. Tekia Shvarim Trua Tekia Tekia Shvarim Tekia Tekia, Trua, Tekia. Arashet Zepati, Noi Arav Lepanecha, El Ram Benisa. Arashet Zepati, My name is Donna Shapiro, and I'm the president of University Synagogue. Um, before I introduce the Bima, I wanted to say a special thank you to Susan Rosenstein and our choir for doing such a beautiful job with the cantor in providing us our music today. And now it is my privilege to introduce the people who are sitting on our Bima. In the first row over here, we have the Kalik family, Andrew, Ivan, and Deborah. In the row behind them, we have Barry and Melanie Landsberg, Angel Castillo. I think you're familiar with Rabbi Feinstein. Um, and on this side, hello, we have Jonathan and Stephanie Carson, and Jeff and Martha Melvoin. And of course, um, our Rabbi Simons, 
and Cantor Shapiro. And now it is also my privilege to introduce one of our past presidents and speakers extraordinaire, Jeffrey Malvoin. Thanks for the setup, Donna. Uh, <laughs> Shana Tova, I'm Jeff Melvoin, past co-president of University Synagogue. And what a beautiful and moving service it's been this morning. And it's almost over, but not quite. Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk to you about the 1956 Suez War, brisket, and the Baal Shem Tov. <laughs> Let's start with brisket. More specifically, my grandmother's brisket. This would be my father's mother, Selma. Despite a largely wretched childhood, or perhaps because of it, Selma was an aggressively cheerful dynamo, five feet tall and continually shrinking, who viewed life's troubles as challenges to overcome. She applied this philosophy to all corners of her life, including the kitchen. For Selma, Food wasn't so much a delicacy to be enjoyed as an enemy to be conquered. <laughs> she would crush the living daylights out of it. No food was so fresh or so tender that it couldn't be boiled, broiled, baked, or stewed into submission. <laughs> Thus, my impression of brisket from an early age was that of an unappetizing slab of brown meat very brown meat. This wasn't merely well done. This was thoroughly done. Finished. Kaput. <laughs> Not the slightest hint that this product ever came from a carbon life form that once walked the earth. It was only years later that I discovered the joys of thinly sliced deli brisket on a Kaiser. And today my dear friend Karen Bell makes a brisket so delicious, it's the centerpiece of our annual joint family Rosh Hashanah dinner. In fact, the difference between what I now know as brisket and what my grandmother made is so profound. I wonder if all these years I've confused what she served with rump roast or something else altogether. Or perhaps she did. In any case, it was unfortunate. And it's the memory that matters. Which brings me to the 56 Suez War more specifically to an Israeli veteran of that war whom I met on vacation over 30 years ago. I was a journalist at the time, always chasing down one story or another, and somehow we got onto the topic of truth versus facts. I pronounce sagely, facts change as we find out more about them, but the truth always stays the same. And this Israeli veteran, older, wiser, with a much longer worldview, smiled wearily and said, no, my friend, just the opposite. The facts remain the same. It's the truth that changes. Over the years, I've come to realize he was right. As a reporter, I might have had trouble discovering the facts of a story, but they were there. Buried, perhaps, obscured, but they were there fixed and immutable. What happened, happened. What was done, was done. What we know about it, how we talk about it, that's different. That's what we call the truth. That's what becomes our story. And stories change over time. Which brings me to the Baal Shem Tov. You'll recall we mentioned him earlier in the service. He's the acclaimed 18th century Polish rabbi, born Yisrael ben Eliezer, who became the father of Hasidism, master of the good name. This great figure of Jewish history appears in the open parable of Elie Wiesel's novel, The Gates of the Forest. Wiesel writes, when the great rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the Jews, it was his custom to go into a certain part of the forest to meditate. There, 
He would light a fire, say a special prayer, and the miracle would be accomplished and the misfortune averted. Later, when his disciple, the celebrated Magid of Mesrich, had occasion for the same reason to intercede with heaven, he would go to the same place in the forest and say, Master of the universe, listen. I do not know how to light the fire, but I am still able to say the prayer. And again, the miracle would be accomplished. Still later, Rabbi Moshe Lieb of Sasoff, in order to save his people once more, would go into the forest and say, I do not know how to light the fire. I do not know the prayer, but I know the place, and this must be sufficient. It was sufficient, and the miracle was accomplished. Then it fell to Rabbi Israel of Rizion to overcome misfortune. Sitting in his armchair, his head in his hands, he spoke to God. I am unable to light the fire, and I do not know the prayer. I cannot even find the place in the forest. All I can do is tell the story, and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. And here's the kicker, the part I love. Wassell ends his introduction with this. God made man because he loves stories. Today, our own clergy stands in the shadow of Wiesel's rabbis. They tremble before the same overwhelming task, the preservation of our people, the transmission of our traditions. Ironically, unlike our Eastern European forebears or many of our contemporaries in today's Europe and elsewhere, it's our very success as American Jews, our ability to assimilate free of persecution in that bubble Rabbi Feinstein mentioned that threatens our existence as a religious community today. Without the coerced need to stick together, many of us, even with the best intentions, drift further and further away from the world our parents and our grandparents knew. We no longer know how to light the fire or recite the prayer or the place in the forest, but we still have our stories. Which brings me back to my grandmother's brisket. My grandchildren will never taste my grandmother's brisket, which admittedly is a blessing. <laughs> but they will hear about it, which is an even greater blessing. And how does my Israeli veteran play into this? It has to do with the truth about my grandmother's brisket. For a long time, that truth for me was the humor I could get out of it. And believe me, I milked it. For one of my grandparents' big anniversaries, the grandchildren were all asked to write brief tributes, poems, songs, remembrances. The expected sentiments poured in. I, however, being in college and exceedingly clever, <laughs> wrote a piece keying on my grandmother's cooking titled Brown and Serve. <laughs> the family howled when it was read. My grandmother scowled. For years afterward, she referred to it as Jeffy's Catharsis. <laughs> Today, when I think about my grandmother's cooking, it's other things I remember. The salt and pepper served in tiny chased silver dishes with glass interiors of royal blue and tiny silver spoons. The marzipan my grandmother shaped and colored into little fruits and vegetables, miniature works of art. Most of all, it's the love that surrounded that table. That's what I remember today. My truth has changed. And the synagogue is the right place to share that. This is where we tell our family stories, large and small, from the very personal to the biblical. This is where our stories change and where our stories change us. The Talmud is a shining example. The day's prayer book is a shining example. The genius of Judaism has been its ability to adapt and survive. We cannot recreate the world of our grandparents even if we wanted to. Our goal is to provide for the world of our children and of our grandchildren. Our stories help us to do that, even as we recognize that succeeding generations will derive different truths from the same set of facts. 
In fact, that's the point. So long as we tell our stories, the congregation will live on. Though not without paying attention to those little white envelopes <laughs> taped to the backs of your chairs. You knew I was going to get there eventually. Our dues do not cover all of the synagogue's operating costs, though we're getting closer, which is a good thing because I'm running out of material. Uh, <laughs> but for now, we still rely on your additional generosity at this time of year to fund many important programs and services we couldn't otherwise afford. Simply stated, we can't live up to the standards we've set for ourselves without this help. So if not for me, for my grandmother's brisket, and for the Baal Shem Tov, please be as generous as you can. Ushers will be coming around to collect your donations, and as they do, allow me to wish you and all your loved ones the happiest of New Year's. Shana Tova. Friends, we're going to turn to 284 for our final set of shofar calls. We invite Dr. Weeder to the bima and invite all who are able to please rise. 284, we got just a little bit left to go. Hold on. We're almost there. One o'clock. We timed. Tekia Shvarim Trua Tekia Tekia Shvarim Tekia 
Takia Takia Terua Takia Gidola distant our God when all shall turn to you in love, when corruption and evil shall give way to integrity and goodness, when lies and bigotry shall no longer enslave the mind, nor idolatry blind the eye. So may all created in your image become one in spirit and one in friendship, forever united in your service. Then shall your dominion be established on earth, and the word of your ancient seer be fulfilled. Adonai will reign forever and ever. And it has been said, Adonai shall reign over all the earth. On that day, Adonai shall be one, and God's name shall be one. <clears throat> see their light long, long after the star itself is gone. So it is with people that we loved. Their memories keep shining ever brightly, though their time with us is done. But the stars that light up the darkest night 
These are the lights that guide us. As we live our days, these are the ways we remember. Our thoughts turn to loved ones whom death has taken from us in recent days, and those who died at this season in years past. Our hearts open as well to the wider circles of loss in our community and wherever grief touches the human family. Zichronam Livracha. May each of their memories be a blessing in this new year and always. Yitkadal v'yitkadash me'i rabba v'alma divra chirute v'yamlich malchute v'chayechon v'yomechon v'chaye d'chol b'et Yisrael v'agala v'zman kari v'imru amen Yehe shmei rabba m'varach la'alam v'alme almaya yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitpa'ar v'yitramam v'yitnaseh v'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal shmei d'kudusha v'richu Laela min kol birchata v'shirata, tushbechata v'nechemata, da'amiran v'alma v'imru, amen. Yehe shlam arraba min shemaya v'chayim, aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru, amen. Oseh shalom b'imromav, hu yaseh shalom, aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru, amen. May the source of peace send peace to all who mourn, comfort all the saddened among us here and wherever they may be, and we say together, amen. amen. Before we turn to 294, let me thank my colleagues, Kanner Shapiro and Rabbi Simons, our rabbinic intern, Lynette Herzog, for their beauty and majesty and service leadership, to Brian and the sound booth for helping the opportunity for everyone to hear us, and we thank you so very much. To Lisa Beth Lobenthal, our executive director, and her staff, and all who work here at the synagogue for their amazing work, for the beautiful music of Susan, and Bill at the keyboard and our entire choir, thank you so very much. To past presidents and sisterhood, to Barry Sykov and his usher corps, to our security, our custodians, to everybody who helped, can you join me in two very, very special words? Thank you. Thank you. 294, friends, let us conclude with this blessing for the new year. We'll see you on Yom Kippur. If you'd like to join us at 315 Lifeguard Station 15 for a Taslich family experience, come informally to the beach and enjoy the rest.